I would like to do is to share with you the fact that uh, we have, over the last couple of days, been having all of our Crystal Circle calls because as well as us running um, our masterminds, we have our Crystal Circle team who are all of those who actually get my personal mentoring every single month. And uh, we had uh, one of our calls yesterday where I just want to give you a bit of a high Light on what people are doing within our community and the awesome work that they're actually up to as well. Um, you know, we actually had uh, from South Africa uh, yesterday one of our Christmas documents, William Butler. He has got a series of different uh, uh, companies which are in tech, uh, which are helping the mining industry. Difficult times when you've got basically everyone like stopping within that industry, uh, but he's managed to basically cut his cost down, very similar to what we did, followed along on all those different pathways kept himself sustainable, had a new startup that he actually decided, right, now now's not the time to start that. And so now he's actually finding his way through it. Uh, another, on um, exactly the same call, couple this time, which is uh, Jeremy and Deborah Harris, who are on this call as well. Which are companies with their, with their finances, clearly, like now's the time when you want to be helping people with their finances. So they have been out there uh, supporting companies and doing that. Uh, and then you have, and as a result, their company has grown and they're now hiring more people off the back of that. So the company's actually grown off the back. Uh, Jim Becker, who actually runs a company which is doing something like $400 million uh, in the US called Becker Logistics. And last year, he was like, getting some challenges with this company, right? Like, there's a lot of competition in the marketplace. People were pushing the price down as well. And basically, he cut all of his costs back. This was before the virus. This was maybe about like back in January, February time that he was actually, you know, in fact, it was last year he started cutting down. January, February, he got, actually got the thing stabilized again. Uh, and then what he's seen is as a result of the uh, entire uh, crisis, there's been all these new deliveries, especially for food deliveries. And so his business has gotten to high profit off the back of that as well. And each one of these different examples is people just saying, right, well, things are moving quickly. How do I be nimble? How do I shift the things I'm doing so I'm in a successful position off the back of that? And I'll give you one more example from that same group, like Karina and Alki, who are uh, in uh, Europe. They have a company called Slumbersack, which actually is very niche. It actually is an online uh, site which helps you to basically get your kid a sleeping bag for them to be sleeping in, like the baby, to sleep in a cot. Uh, and it stops cot deaths, which is pretty cool, right? But at the moment, I mean, like while there's lots of, you know, parents at home with their kids and you could say, well, you know, there might be some demand for it. There has been a lot of different products, especially fashion, which has been dropping in terms of the revenues that's generated while other ones have been actually rising. Um, and what they did was they actually decided to retool their entire factory to create not sleeping bags, but actually to create face masks. And so because of that, they have had like orders going through the roof every day. They're getting a thousand new orders for face masks just by them just shifting their entire business model. So it's something, something totally different. There is no shortage of success stories of what people have been doing over the last four weeks, which I think is just awesome. So I just wanted to share a few different stories and hopefully uh, you are all posting down whatever is your big story that you are sharing as well as we're going through this. We are going to be going through one of the top five waves that has now appeared as a result of what's happened with this crisis. But basically, uh, I wanted to start with this here, which is a little quote. Nothing we do can change the past, but everything we do changes the future. Now, that might sound very obvious, but too many of us worry about the past or worry about basically even, uh, you know, how do we resurrect the things that we had that were working instead of saying, wait, hang on a minute. If I actually thought for a moment about what's going to happen, uh, it might actually be a really, really good thing that the things that were working before are no longer working or the things that I was trying to get to work are no longer working. What if I just stepped right into the future? So those of you who missed our last module, I highly recommend you go back to it because it's when we're talking about the opportunities. And on that one, I was showing all the different ways uh, with smart investments and then also with basic opportunities, the ways you can actually go about even going out and buying a business for a dollar, um, the different things that are available. And if you start thinking in that way, you get a very, very, very different picture of the uh, amazing opportunity we have by being alive today. After we get over the actual shock of the crisis, the fact that we're in it, everything's on a reset. Everything's changing. And our ability to shift that change is really everything. What I'm going to do is actually take you through a bit of a journey of the last, uh, the last just you know, couple of days worth of news uh, and what's actually out there at the moment, which is already highlighting these, these things that are out there too. Right. So this, by the way, is something which you missed that we did on Monday, which was with Joe. And this was our uh, webinar on health. And we learned a whole bunch of things by just even putting it on the page like this in terms of how many people were super excited to actually do things with us. Um, and we got like about, you know, what, I think eight to 10 times more sales than normal of people buying things just by us actually really understanding how people, when they get somewhere, want to stay there rather than go somewhere else. Uh, and uh, we're learning all this on a day-to-day -day basis on the key things that we're up to. Uh, let me take this one here, which is basically um, a story 
uh, that I, uh, I touched on last time, but I want to start with now. This is Bill Gates talking about how much life is going to change. And while I mentioned this on the last call, let me just highlight a few points to this where he says things like, it won't be where you're doing large public gatherings or even filling up a restaurant, unless it's when we first start opening. Um, but then he goes on from that to actually ask questions. Will people want to go and travel? Will they want to go to restaurants? Will they even think, you know, maybe buying a new home is an appropriate thing? So even once the government is saying these activities are okay, we can't expect the demand side to remove overnight. So he's like saying already, things are going to be slow to get started. And there is this hump that people have to get through. There were these, um, these stories coming out of Italy because Italy is now starting to open up some shops like, uh, you know, uh, you've got like bookstores or like, you know, uh, like pharmacies and other things that they're actually opening up again. And, uh, and some like a bookstore owner was actually saying, like, I can't actually open because whereas when I was in lockdown, I was getting paid by the government. Now that I'm starting up my, 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 my shop, I've got all these costs, but people aren't coming into the shop. So it means I'm actually losing a lot more money than if I just kept the shop. So you're actually having this like catch 22 that's happening as people start trying to open up again, which will be happening. But Bill goes a lot further than that and actually starts even talking about what happens beyond that. You know, there are a few things like business trips that I doubt would ever go back. I mean, there will still be these trips, but there should be less of them because people will actually realize they can actually just work remotely from each other. He says, you know, what about things like virtual courtrooms? What about virtual legislature? Like, how could we actually design all these things because you're going to have people saying, like, our habits have changed. You know, you've all heard that whole concept that if you actually want to build a habit, you need to basically keep doing the same thing for about, you know, two to three months or about like, you know, 12 weeks. Well, in exactly the same way, if you want to break a habit, you've got to keep it going for about 12 weeks. This entire lockdown is going to be about 12 weeks, which means that whatever habits we had in the past collectively as a humanity are all going to be broken, which means we can start them all over again. So just take that as a thought and said, if you had a habit that you wanted to change or to break, what would that habit be? And it doesn't have to even be a bad habit, like some kind of advice or something that you should be doing more of. It can be a habit about what you're doing at work, like how busy you're being or about how much you're traveling or about you know, how much you're actually going to the office when you don't need to go to the office. What would be some things that you actually assumed before you had to do where suddenly you realize you don't have to do those things and you can still get by that you simply wouldn't go back to again, right? So this, I think, is a really good article because he's really thinking deeply about what are those shifts that are actually going to happen. Um, let's have a look at this one here. This one I wanted to share as beginnings of the fact that you don't have to wait that long for a wave, right? This one, I'm going to give you these links as well, right? This came out today. This is an article from today. Jeff Bezos got $6.4 billion richer as Amazon stocks hit a new record high. And by the way, he did that in one day, which was basically yesterday, Tuesday. He just made $6.4 billion. So Amazon is now at a record high. It's got, actually gone up over 20% this year already, which means it's gone 30% up, or sorry, 40% up since the low. Uh, and it's basically now like the, 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 the most successful it's ever been. Um, and that's because clearly lots of people are buying online, right? So that's obviously a really, really big part of why that's happening. Um, but you don't have to wait because there's people already doing this and we've already just gave some examples of this happening as well. Uh, there's another site here. I'll try not to actually post on top of each site because that's a bit stupid. I don't get to actually post it to you as well. So let me just go to this one. This is, uh, you know, I mean, you've all seen like, you know, just how much these, these companies have been growing, but actually Netflix a long time and hit their all time high ever on their stocks when the stock market is still down by 20%, right? So this is all happening because you're seeing everyone changing their habits. Uh, and this is all leading into the very first of the waves that I want to mention. Um, the first of the waves, let me just give you a few more links so you can really just get an idea of this. There's something that is, uh, that is really interesting about the way that we're changing our habits. Uh, this is New York Times, the virus changed the way we internet. So in this one here, you've actually got a shift in websites, which are all going up by 16%. So this is not a surprise, right? Netflix, YouTube, all going up by about 15, 6%. Um, but it's a lot more than apps. So people are being going off apps. I mean, like when we're actually walking around, we use our apps more, but what's happening is because we're staying at home, we're all going onto the big screen. So we're actually spending more time on our computers, on our smart TVs, um, and not actually spending them so much on apps. So it could be that the future of apps is actually now shifting to much more big screens. And this is what Microsoft is doing with the surfaces where we suddenly actually start actually realizing we don't need a mobile phone. We can actually just take a surface wherever we go. So we're going to see an acceleration of technologies from the past. This here is the rise in all of these different like video chats of people coming together. So we know about Zoom, but these are other ones as well. Next door house party have all gone up by 70%, 80% already. Um, you know, this is the growth of just how much we've all been interacting with each other. See how much Zoom has grown, but all of them have gone up. Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams have all gone up massively. And we're seeing just all these trends where we're not talking about a small increase. We're talking about a massive increase. 
and also trust, right? Wikipedia has gone down at the same time as others like CDC has gone up. Uh, and we're actually seeing that basically we're all going straight to the source and the source themselves are being much, much more proactive at getting information to us as well on these different areas. Obviously things like video games, these are all shifting in this way as well. So this is very likely to be a wave which is not suddenly gonna go off in the opposite direction. And you might be surprised to hear that there are all of these uh, venture capital deals happening in the middle of the crisis. VR Workplace Training Startup Striver lands $30 million Series B. This just happened on March the 31st, right? So this is basically where you've got a company that is actually providing VR software um, for companies to actually do work with each other. And at the moment, they said, hey, this is the perfect time to go out and tell our story because everyone's needing our service right now and our numbers are going through the roof. So they raised $30 million off the back of it. Um, this is another example here, which is an uh, example. This is going to happen, isn't it? I'm going to actually post all these. I'm going to open these things in my whole computer and going to crash again. Dining and take up startup or set raises $8.25 million to adapt to life under lockdown. Same thing like that. We're actually going to see uh, this shift to uh, uh, like ordering for the home, which is not going to suddenly reverse. We're going to see less people going to restaurants. We're going to see more people realizing they actually enjoy being at home, not just because it's lockdown, but because it's more convenient. Uh, this company, Shippo, raised $30 million uh, to actually just make shipping more efficient because shipping itself has grown massively because we're all realizing we don't need to go to where the action is. We can get the action to come to us, which is obviously what Amazon knew all the way along. But the fact is now we're all realizing it. And while some of us, especially in this community, already knew this stuff, the vast majority of people didn't really know it. They didn't know they could actually work from home and not have to commute until they're actually forced to do it. Um, as coronavirus forces millions to work remotely, the US economy may have reached a tipping point in favor of working from home. So we're actually seeing this shift take place right now. So I'm going at the moment from uh, the very, very first of a wave that's currently happening which is future 5.0 to a second one, which is work anywhere. They're interrelated. So we used to talk about financial freedom. I think we're going to be talking a lot more about work freedom, like the whole concept of work being something where you actually got to make it feel like it's hard work. Uh, you've got to go to an office. You've got to sit down and be supervised. I think all of that is actually shifting massively. Uh, and the whole concept of society 5.0 is that we're given the power to do these things. So if you've already been working remotely, you know this, right? We teach this at iLab that if you actually have the tools and use the tools, you can be anywhere in the world and you can run your business more effectively than if you're at home. The vast majority of people don't actually know that. Whereas now they've actually been forced to experience it and they're going, hey, wow, this is actually better. I don't have to commute every day. I can actually do everything from my home. I can have technology work for me instead of me being the one that works with technology, right? So when that shift happens, you don't go back, right? This is not something that suddenly shifts and, and everyone goes, oh, let's just go back to the office again. So we're gonna see a huge shift in the way that people actually start working. And what's very interesting about this is that on the one hand, you have this whole kind of concept of people working at home saying, well, why would I actually even go back? And these stories here are actually talking about the fact, you know, we've had this like 10% of growth uh, over the 10 years, but now we're going to see this ex massive acceleration where even if people are told to go back to their office, they'll go speak to their boss and say, look, seriously, can I just go work from home instead? Um, this here uh, is another uh, site here, which is all about this um, coronavirus pandemic, work from home is a new name for freedom where I wanted to kind of like mention that like we, 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 at the moment, the buzzword is remote working. Even our group is called remote workers, right? So like, you know, remote working is something which, um, which does describe uh, what we do when we are actually remote from each other. But there's something else about remote working, which actually is a misnomer, a little bit like social distancing. Like it's actually the fact that by social distancing, we actually have spent more time for our family. We actually get more connected. In the same time, remote working actually gets you more connected than remote. Because it puts you where, like someone who's remote working from home, what are you remote to? I mean, you're actually at home. So you're not remote from your family. You're not remote from your life. You're just remote from your workplace, right? You're just remote from a place you don't want to be at. So, so, so actually, we should be actually re-looking at the word and saying maybe it isn't ever going to be a remote, remote working in the future, right? We would call it remote working right now, but maybe it's some level of freedom of work, right? Or in the case of like some people out there talking about flexible work, um, the gig economy, by the way, the gig economy has already been growing massively. You may be surprised to hear that gig economy basically is someone who's actually got a job that isn't a full-time job or one that they actually created for themselves instead of had to go and, 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 and apply to get for themselves. Um, and it's everything from freelance workers to Uber drivers. Uh, in China already, we're already at 45% of the entire Chinese population is either working full-time in the gig economy or is part-time in the gig economy which is massively more than the number in America, which is only 14% at this point. Uh, so it's like three times more in every respect. Uh, India is not far behind. And again, that wouldn't be a surprise because in places like China and India, you have a mass of people who actually have to create their own job. They can't just work, work you know, hope that someone's going to give them a job. The rest of the world's going to go the same way. 
Uh, and so effectively, the East is actually leading on this right now. So the idea of basically freedom working, as opposed to remote working, like freedom working is like you can work from anywhere, is something that we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, we are now serving that market. And it's a huge market that's growing right now as well. The whole work from anywhere market, we are actually seeing a third of the entire workforce right now in the US already at this point. We're getting to half the workforce in China. I think after we actually finish this crisis, we'll have half of the world's population already there. We'll, we'll just accelerate that quickly towards that space. I, I think that's really what's gonna happen. And that kind of leads us um, into what else can we do remotely? Like what are the other things that are gonna lead us into that? If you think of any kind of business, or even think, well, why don't I just be more of a remote worker? Like where is my resume? Is it on Upwork? Is it on TopTal? Like is it on one of those places that we talked about before to set yourself up freelancing? Because more and more people are gonna go there and actually contract a workout when they get started as well, right? Um, what is with your time? They're not, they're not liking me today. Yeah, maybe I'll try this. Uh, there it is, all right. Um, hallelujah for Chrome that they can find all my stuff. After coronavirus, colleges worry. Will students come back? This is another permanent fixture of what's gonna happen, is that more and more people are gonna realize not only do they need to travel to go to college, they don't even need college. I mean, like, there's like, what, what was that? why was they so worried about that? Like, they're not even like graduating people and there's other ways I can go out there and get a job. And so the entire tertiary market, I think, is going to go through a massive shift. Um, those who actually want to go to college are more likely to do it online. Those who actually look at the price of college offline compared to online, as some of them would have had to do, would be going, this is ridiculous. Uh, lots of people that are paying private school fees who actually are realizing their kids are getting a better education by actually using some online app are going to be questioning, why am I spending all that money on private schooling? We're on the edge of the precipice, how the pandemic could shatter college dreams. So this whole story from Politico is about how colleges are really worried right now that people just simply aren't going to come back because the entire system is broken down. Right? So this is basically now getting to the third uh, of our waves. I'm, I'm zooming through these, right? Because I want to cover all of them and make sure that you're getting a picture that there are certain things that are not going to go back the way they were. The learn from anywhere, everywhere wave is the fact that we can actually now become a fully learning humanity that is learning as we go, where we don't have to go and basically kind of like go brain dead when we're actually in a job, but we're actually now able to evolve and um, be effectively in university for life, right? Learn all the way through our lives. This is Harvard Business Review. I mean, this is Harvard itself, right? That is actually got this story here. I don't know why this stuff's not actually even opening, but let me see. There it is. Uh, this story here, what the shift of virtual learning could mean for the future of higher ed. The, all these stories, by the way, are all from the last week or two, right? So they're all very, very, very recent, uh, where people are actually there really thinking deeply about these issues right now. And this is Harvard itself asking questions like, do students really need a four-year residential experience, right? This is Harvard asking this. And, and as you guys heard from an earlier call, I'm currently doing a Harvard program online, which is with Harvard Business School. Um, and I can tell you, it's a whole lot easier doing it online and doing it in my own time uh, than having to go and actually sit there for the two years I'd have to do uh, in the meantime, and I'm going through it way, way faster as well, right? So like this, these are asking all the questions we already know the answer to, right? Which is like, should we actually be going online? And the answer is obviously yes, but this is actually going through and really questioning from the actual institutions themselves what this all means too. So here's what I'm gonna do for a second, right? I mean, whatever just already from what I just shared, uh, I'm, I'm gonna open a couple more, right? Because I wanna make sure I've got all of these, and I'd love for you to be commenting which of these you resonate most with um, but at the same time, where you see the potential opportunity being for your business too from this, right? Corona pandemic has unleashed a revolution in education. From now on, blended learning. You know, we talk about this right now, high tech and high touch together. It's not about just doing something online without any um, interaction with someone. It's about bringing content and community together online. So you have both high tech and high touch, and you have someone who's actually there to mentor you along the way as well. This is what we're doing in May when we actually create our entire um, Genius Institute programs that we're going to be running online. We're actually creating an entire series, which is called the Crisis Leadership Academy. And the Crisis Leadership Academy is going to be all about how we make sure that everyone at every level of business is able to be a crisis leader. Very different from crisis manager that's there basically managing reactively. This is a crisis leader who's using crisis as a springboard to a much, much higher place. That's the difference, right? A crisis manager gets down, whereas a crisis leader steps up, right? Which is a very different thing. So this is about basically talking about the, the, the future of education and how we're already moving into it. Um, in Singapore, uh, Singapore is really ahead in all these ways. Right? It's pretty incredible how, quick, how fast they move. Uh, Singapore just uh, invested uh, and put another round of funding into this company here, which is an ed tech company based in Singapore that's supporting the Indian market, which is the fastest growing education market in the world. Uh, some of you would have seen that we were sharing that 
the uh, biggest uh, growth in IPOs in the world was in the education market in China uh, in the latter part of last year. It's now become India. Uh, so basically, we're seeing this huge growth where uh, lots of people that can't actually get into the universities because there aren't enough of them in India, they're actually going on to online learning instead. Uh, so it's a massive market. Um, and uh, we are going to see China and India be the ones that lead in all of these things we talk about, freedom working, uh, uh, online learning. So if you want to see, well, where should I go in the world to figure this stuff out? You know, go to these countries, right? Here's Vedantu. They just got $12.5 million uh, in India to actually build the entire India um, education platform and curriculum that they've got basically uh, going out. And this is a tutoring platform. So the way that it works is this, basically you go there, you find the right tutors, uh, you pay those tutors directly. It's like Uber for education, basically. Uh, and as a result, you can find the people that need to help you. You can actually effectively build your own school with your own tutors and then get all the curriculum you need. You get to choose your teachers as opposed to what actually happens in most universities and schools, which is you have no choice over it. You choose the school, they choose the teachers, right? So this gets rid of the middleman, which is the school itself, and take you down the road of micro schools where the teachers themselves become the schools. So this is all part of the growth and the phases we're taking, where we're going to. What are the other two ways? And how can we actually use these ways as we go forward? So here is a link uh, to a story that I'm gonna share with you. This is from England. Coronavirus robot doctor could help with future outbreaks. So have a think about this for a moment. Um, which are the factories which are currently operating? They're actually the ones that are most mechanized because they weren't sent home because robots can't get the virus, right? So there are parts of the world, like, especially in places like China, which have been humming along uh, and actually, China's going to see a growth in its economy this year by all projections, while other economies are going to go down 10% or 20%. Um, and uh, the same is happening in places where they've actually used robotics um, to not have uh, the front line, uh, the, hurt, the doctors and nurses put in harm's way. This is all going to accelerate massively. Uh, in China, uh, in Korea, this is already happening. Um, and it's not just robots, it's AI as well. One of the biggest issues at the moment is privacy. Like everyone knows if we actually could help track people and actually have proper contact tracing, uh, then we'd actually be able to very, very quickly solve a lot of uh, the control on the coronavirus. Why do people not want to do it? Many of you saw uh, my, um, <laughs> my, my post. I found it so funny because there was a lot of like anger uh, of like, you know, this one here, which I posted on, would you agree to digital tracking if it gave you back your freedom? And there's all sorts of big, no, 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 no. Because obviously like a lot of us really, really, uh, value our freedom, right? We're totally like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, but here's the question. If you actually knew your freedom, that you're, you were not going to get tracked by any human being that could use it for bad, but you actually had it in some place where you, uh, for example, had your own virtual AI, who was your person who you got to control, who you could actually go tell what to do. And that AI could come back and tell you whether you were in trouble or not. Why? Because the AI itself had its own personal identity and could go online and could basically go and share what it was doing with others, uh, but it only shared with other AIs, and no one was able to actually even access what those AIs were chatting about, um, what's the chances maybe you might do something? I've talked about this in the past, that the future businesses will be AIs, right? They're gonna be basically AI uh, CEOs who are gonna be actually running programs. This company, Onfido, they have an AI-based ID verification platform, which means they don't actually get to see any of the information. The AI is the one that drives all of it. They just raised $100 million like yesterday. I mean, this just happened where they raise all this money because everyone sees what a, what a need it is to have a privacy, but also to have intelligence. Because right now we have privacy without intelligence or we have intelligence without privacy. And I talk about intelligence, not human intelligence. I'm talking about superhuman intelligence, like, like the, the, the hive intelligence of all of us put together. No one wants one person to control all of that. But with AI, if it's designed in the right way, discreetly for different apps that do different things, and the data from that is not able to be accessed by everybody, um, then you actually do have a solution that can actually work. So this whole concept of super intelligent uh, and super intelligence or where we're heading, uh, I think this one was totally the wrong thing. I don't know what I was even looking at here. Let me try again. Um, I think that one of the most powerful things about this is the way that we actually are seeing the relationship we have with machines totally transform. This one here, COVID-19 will accelerate AI's replacement of humans as a factor of production. So we all suddenly realize, look, the only thing wrong with the fact that we actually can't go to work is that the economy suffers because we can't go to work. But if we actually had computers doing our jobs at work, or at least all the jobs that we need doing, right? Like if you knew that you actually could actually, like if we were five years in the future and you knew that if you were actually going to be, you know, getting someone to, you know, to, 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 to be delivering goods to you, or you're going to go to a supermarket 
and get food or you're going to get food. Like if you actually had computers or robots that were able to do this stuff for you, where you wasn't, where there was no issue with like viruses or people going on strike or anything like that stuff, there's a very good chance you'd actually go for that provided you actually were still earning money in other ways, right? So the real question is, um, like all of these things that we're saying what we might do by actually not looking at ourselves as a means of production, but actually having AI do that, what would that then allow us to do? So if the fourth wave, which is this wave here, superhuman intelligence was that fourth wave, and we were freed up from having to do all that work, which is what actually is creating the economic crisis we're about to go into, and the, and the, and the entire production machine can keep on growing without input just in the way we're needed, and we could all get paid from it, because think about it for a moment, right? Where are most people getting paid from right now? They're actually getting paid from the government. The government's actually paying, paying money for the bailout. Where's the government getting the money for that? Well, they're actually not. They're hoping that from the debt, it'll get paid back from the future. But if it happened that already we had factories that could be run by robots, and those factories that were being run by robots were being taxed by the government, and then the government was giving us that money, or in fact, cities themselves were getting the money from the robots and paying the people, would we not do that given that we're already doing that? Right, so think about that as a future, right? That we actually have got a future where suddenly we realize it is possible for us all to be living and to be getting paid to live and to actually effectively have some level of universal basic income to be living with. The only thing is we didn't connect the dots to make sure that productivity continued at the same time. So we all know we've got to go back to work because we haven't figured that out yet. But when we do go back to work, we're all going to be going, what are we here for? I mean, surely there's other things we should be doing with our lives. Some of you have learned new hobbies during this time. Some of you have learned in a whole new way. Some of you have felt freer than ever before because you actually suddenly have realized, wow, you know what? I get the freedom to think about things in a way that I wasn't thinking about before. Um, and with that, we get to the fifth wave, which is the one that you've been hearing me talk about, the worldwide wealth and the whole concept of a new renaissance. What's really nice at the moment is that the entire um, zeitgeist is now talking about this. So, you know, here is an example of this, right? This here... Uh, beginning of a new era, how culture went virtual in the face of the crisis. What's happened to a lot of the different galleries out there? You know, some of the places like the Greek government with their tourism is they said, well, if people can't come to us, we'll go to the people. And there's now all these virtual reality tours, video tours, where you can be basically wherever you are in the world and you get to access the best artwork. You get to actually see the most amazing things out there. And we ourselves are now creating new artwork. I mean, we're going back to the time of the artisan where we actually value our time with each other more than before we're spending more time in conversation you know here i am talking to you where it's a two-way conversation where i get to chat with you after i finish here uh, in ways that when we're so busy we didn't get time for all this stuff uh, and we're seeing this now evolve and grow where we basically are seeing all around the world this whole thoughtfulness about what is it to be human the coming digital renaissance this actually just came out today uh this is in Forbes magazine and it's talking about like the whole history of birth growth decline renewal the same thing we talked about with the fourth turning. Do you remember when I talked about uh, the fourth turning? I said that the actual uh, archetype uh, for the fourth turning is the artist. Uh, that's the renaissance. That's what we are actually stepping into right now. And it's effectively a collective. Whenever there's a new idea, it's, it's not your idea. Anytime you've had an idea, it's like, oh, that's a good idea I had. It's not yours. It's just that you tuned into a frequency, which was the idea. Um, this is the frequency we've been talking about, which everyone's tuning into now. We just happened to tune into it a little bit earlier. Right? But these whole seasons of actually linking all this together, which is the generation of changes we're going through, and now being the fourth turning, um, this is possible today in a way it never was possible before because of these ways that are coming our way. Because we now have AI, we actually have got robotics, um, the only thing that stopped us was our own human consciousness. And it's almost like the final exam, which was that our human consciousness is to increase to actually harness that technology, it's almost like the world had to stop, or nature had to make it stop, or someone or something had to make it stop. Some higher intelligence had to actually say, guys, just chill. Like, just take time out and just get where you're at in the world today. Like, look at all these tools. Look at all this abundance. Look at all these ways we can work with each other. So just get it together as humans and then get back together again. And so there's this reset that's taking place at the moment that actually links all this together into a big way where the, the first four allowed the fifth one to happen in a, in a way that in the past some of us might have wanted to happen, but now it's actually happening. There's this great quote from Bucky. The true business of people should be to go back to school and think about whatever it was they were thinking about before someone came along and told them they had to earn a living. And to me, back to school is not the traditional school or basically going to a classroom. Today, back to school is learning from everywhere. I mean, our planet is the school, right? So it's about going back to the earth, going back to the planet, going back to mother nature, which is our biggest teacher, and saying, all right, we're ready to listen now. Uh, and as we all know, 
you know, one thing for sure that's happening right now is the animals are having a great time right now. You know, there's actually this, uh, this here I want to share with you as a kind of a final thought. And I'd love for you to actually share whatever's been biggest learning out of this call uh, for you, right? like what you're getting out of this call for yourself at the moment and what kind of like, you know, wave out of those five you want to be surfing because there's a place for us in all those ways right now. Um, but if I actually go to uh, Tao, Tao Game Lodge, um, what's really wild is uh, Renata who uh, manages our social media side. Um, she basically, oh, oh actually, doggies. Uh, this, uh, oh, she just posted this as well. Okay, so um, Jack was uh, busy at work. This is uh, Cheetah walking past the family suite at the moment. Uh, uh, she was saying on our call today that there's actually someone who was actually live, watching our live stream because you can actually go to the Tao website and there's a live stream there as well. Uh, and here's the cheetah actually walking past the Tao lodge as well. And like, we're, like, like the earth has come alive. Like everyone's super happy. There's not as much pollution that like humans aren't kind of like tramping around their safari lodges. Like this is all happening at the moment. It's only the humans that are really feeling the issues. If anything else, the rest of the world is giving a breather to, to, to recover right now. But this is our chance to actually take a breather as well realize just what a powerful future we have ahead of us. And so when I talk about this being the silver lining, which is really what this one's all about, um, it's a, it really is a silver lining, right? That as the clouds lift, which might take, you know, four or five years, but during this time, the lining is still going to be there. Uh, those of us who make up that lining, those of us who actually shine the light onto others, um, that's what's going to be the world we're going to be living in. And in 10 years time, when we look back, we're going to be saying at that point, wow, like tragic as it was, if it wasn't for the crisis that we had in 2020, um, we would still be trying to convince people and get people to catch up to the consciousness and the potential that humans have uh, to really be able to create the most incredible future. So I wanted to finish with that thought. And I know many of you have heard me talk about this. <laughs> if anything, I'm like a broken record talking about these things over the years. But the fact that it's not just me talking about this, but we're seeing this in the mainstream media now, we're seeing this in the top leaders in the world, actually saying now's the time, this is when it's actually happening. And the fact that uh, we are going from the minority to the majority. I think that's where the real power in this is right now. Um, so do have a look at those five waves, the waves I just mentioned right there. Uh, and it might be the wave which is about future 5.0 and using all these tools. It might be work anywhere, learn everywhere, super intelligence, uh, superhuman intelligence, which we're obviously bringing into Ingenious you and how we actually find out the very, very best within us and what comes and rise to the top as well. And then finally, the new renaissance, actually being one of those artists that actually create that new future. Uh, you decide for yourself where you want to play. But the great thing is this is a game, the war game, which has enough place for everybody, right? So we can all be the players. Uh, and on that note, I want to say thank you very much for listening. I will come into the sections now on the chat. So anything you'd like to say as a message for me or anything you'd like to say um, as a question uh, that uh, you'd like an answer to, uh, I'll jump into that as well. Uh, so thank you very much for listening in. I will catch up with you in the comments and we will catch you on Friday. See you later.